Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be taking a look at another disturbing case with you. On the morning of August 29, 2016, Mary Call became concerned when her daughter Cloda didn't drop off her two youngest sons, Niall and Ryan, as planned. Unable to reach her or her husband Alan on their phones or receive responses to her texts, Mary then drove to their home at Oakdean Downs in Barkany. Upon arrival, she noticed both family cars in the driveway and closed curtains in the sitting room and bedrooms, which immediately raised alarm bells for her. It wasn't like Cloda to not contact her if she was running late. At first, Mary Cole feared her daughter Cloda and her grandchildren might have fallen victim to carbon monoxide poisoning. When she approached the back door with her key, she saw a note taped to the inside which ordered not to enter and to call the police. Recognizing Alan's handwriting on the note, Mary became deeply suspicious that something terrible had happened. She immediately called emergency services at approximately 10.40 a.m. and then sought out her neighbor, Edith Harrigan, informing her that Alan had likely done something to her daughter. On 29th August 2016, we lost our daughter and sister, Cloda, and her lovely sons, Liam, Niall, and Ryan, in the most horrific circumstances. This is the case of the Haw family. Our love and respect goes out to all those who knew and loved the victims of the Haw family and all those affected by this case. Alan and Clota Haw were both educators deeply involved in their local communities. Alan Haw, originally from Windgap in County Kilkenny, was a deputy principal at Castle Rahan National School near Barconi, where the family lived. Clota Haw, formerly Clota Call, came from Mount Nugent, a village in the southern part of County Cavan, not far from Bally James Duff. She worked as a teacher at Oristown National School, which is located southeast of Kells in County Meath. They had three sons, 13-year-old Liam, 11-year-old Niall, and 6-year-old Ryan. The previous evening, everything seemed normal to Mary. They enjoyed tea, biscuits, and conversation in the kitchen while their three sons watched television in the sitting room. Cloda mentioned plans to drop off Niall and Ryan at Mary's house early the next morning, as Liam had school. She assured Mary not to worry if she was a bit late, as Cloda did not have students to attend to that day. Before leaving, Mary wished Alan luck as he prepared to return to school after the summer break. Alan thanked her for the treats, referring to the biscuits she had offered them. Little did Mary know that this would be the last time she would see Alan alive. The next morning, when Mary became alarmed at not hearing from Cloda and attempted to reach her without success, she drove to the Haw family home in Burconi. Discovering the note on the back door and recognizing Alan's handwriting, she immediately called the police. Officer Alan Ratcliffe arrived and, using Mary's key, entered the house. Inside, he found Clota Haw's lifeless body on the couch in the sitting room, dressed in pajamas with severe head injuries. A knife and a small axe were found nearby on the floor. Alan Haw's body was discovered in the hallway. He took his own life. Moving upstairs, Garda Ratcliffe found Liam and Niall Haw in separate bedrooms, both with throat injuries indicative of their tragic deaths. In another bedroom, he found Ryan Haw also deceased, with a knife placed on his pillow. The master bedroom contained neatly arranged jewelry and jewelry boxes on the bed. Garda Ratcliffe informed his colleague about the five bodies inside the house, then joined her and Mary Call outside the property, where Mary was waiting anxiously. Garda Allen Ratcliffe informed Mary Call that he found no survivors inside the house when he arrived. The detectives also found various items, including documents, a sealed envelope containing a letter, and a note on the kitchen table. Some of these items were stained with blood. It was later discovered that Alan Haw's right palm print was identified on the blood-stained hatchet found at the scene. The letter inside the envelope was written by Alan after he murdered Cloda while their sons were asleep. The victim's family, who were withheld the note by Irish police, known as Gardi, for 16 months, believe Alan Haw wrote it in two parts starting after murdering his wife and finishing after killing his sons. Haw began his spree 
by murdering his wife Clota as she sat on the couch in their sitting room using an axe he kept in the shed. He then sat at the kitchen table to write his murder-suicide letter, sealing it in an envelope. Next, he took a kitchen knife and walked upstairs to attack his three sleeping sons. After killing them, he returned to add more words to the outside of the envelope. During the investigation, it was discovered that Alan Haw had planned his actions meticulously. He retrieved the axe from the shed and moved furniture so that Clota would have her back turned as he entered the sitting room. At that moment, Clota was innocently browsing holidays online and having tea. Alan approached from behind and brutally attacked her with the axe, stabbing her in the back and nearly severing her hand as she tried to defend herself. After murdering Clota, Alan sat down to write the letter, leaving the axe and knife on the floor. He then made his way upstairs with a new knife. He knelt on Liam's chest and cut his windpipe to prevent him from screaming. Niall, sharing the room with Liam, likely didn't wake up immediately due to Liam's inability to make noise, but he had defensive wounds on his hands. Alan repeated the same brutal act with Niall before moving to Ryan's room. Ryan, the youngest and smallest of the three boys, was subjected to a particularly cruel and violent attack. According to the testimony given during the investigation, Haw used a sawing motion on Ryan before covering all of them with a duvet and leaving the knife he used on Ryan's pillow. Afterward, he returned downstairs to write more, transferred money, and organized paperwork while his family lay dead around him. Haw transferred 2,500 euros from the joint account to his own in the early hours of the morning after the killings. Reflecting on the immediate aftermath, Jacqueline and her mother Mary Call expressed their dismay at the lack of initial support they received. They recalled how on the Monday following the murders, they struggled to reach out to people for help and information, finding themselves informed more by media reports than by official sources. Um, the person approached me, they lived in the locality of where Claude and the boys live, lived and they said to me that they had seen Alan Hall the morning after the murders, around 6.30 that morning, on the way to the direction of the school in the family car and that person had made a statement to the guards saying that they had seen him and they told me what guard they would given the statement to and where they would given the statement and had given me a lot of information around it and we just want to know is that true? When we meet Drew Harris we're going to raise the access to the guard files, we'd like to see statements and who made statements and we would like to raise issues that we experienced as a family. We would like to see changes in the Succession Act 1965 but at present we feel there's no legitimate reason for it to be stalled considering the families that have been affected in this country. Finally we would like to thank everybody all over the country who has shown us such support in this last number of days. We now know that Clauda Liam, Niall and Ryan are finally getting the respect that they deserve. We are so, so thankful to everybody. We cannot thank everybody individually, but thank you comes from the bottom of our heart. Her name is Clota. It wasn't until two weeks before the inquest, 16 months after the tragedy, that they finally received a copy of Alan's letter. This letter provided chilling insights into Alan's state of mind leading up to the murders, including how he rearranged furniture to carry out his plans. The note began with, All the good stuff we did, I was really into it. But I think there was some sort of psychosis that made me enjoy that yet, in the next moment, I was the complete opposite. He continued with an apology for his actions. I'm sorry for how I murdered them all, but I simply had no other way. I'm sure I've gotten lots of what I wanted to say properly, some badly. I know to many I was so nice to them, but they never knew the real me. He ended with, God bless you all. Be good to your families. I just don't know what it was that I was so normal yet so dark and no one could see it. At first, the Irish press highlighted Alan Haw as a highly respected member of the community. He was depicted as the head of a church-going family, the dedicated vice principal of a local national school, 
an athletics enthusiast, and a former teenage handball champion. He was described as the most normal man you could meet, a brilliant dad, and a kind and decent person with an overriding need to look after those around him. These glowing testimonials painted a picture of Haw as a caring and well-adjusted family man, making the contrast with his brutal actions all the more shocking. In June 2016, Alan Haw's carefully constructed facade began to crumble when he was caught viewing pornography on a school computer. It is believed that this incident occurred at the school where he taught. Haw had accessed 97% of his pornography on his school laptop and some on his phone, keeping this hidden from his wife, Cloda. Mary Call, Cloda's mother, recalled a conversation with Cloda in February 2016, where Cloda revealed that Alan had confessed to watching pornography. This admission strained their relationship, which led Haw to start attending counseling sessions every Tuesday night. Cloda assured her mother that things were under control, but Mary could sense Cloda's underlying distress. Haw's counseling sessions initially focused on his porn addiction, but later shifted to address issues arising at the school. But after this exposure, Haw's world began to spiral dangerously out of control. Haw's troubles signified internal struggle. His double life, marked by an appearance of normalcy and an inner turmoil, likely contributed to his psychological decline. But what was his motive? Investigating Gardee quickly determined that Haw had no clinical history of mental health issues, nor had he ever been referred to or sought mental health services. In the days leading up to the murders, locals did not notice any signs of change in Haw's mental state, mood, or behavior. But the absence of obvious indicators does not mean Haw did not experience severe emotional distress. At the Cavan Coroner's Court, psychiatry professor Harry Kennedy presented his findings based on extensive documentation regarding Alan Haw's mental health. Professor Kennedy's report was compiled without direct interaction with Mr. Haw, relying instead on records from Haw's GP, counselor, and his suicide note. According to Professor Kennedy's assessment, Haw had been grappling with somatic anxieties since 2008 which involved worries about physical health issues escalating into severe preoccupations. These anxieties were accompanied by ruminations, scruples, and exaggerated feelings of guilt, all indicative of a major depressive illness. Professor Kennedy highlighted that by the time of the murder-suicide, Haw had transitioned from long-term depression to a severe episode that included psychotic symptoms. He emphasized that severe mental illness significantly impairs judgment, suggesting that Haw's actions were influenced by this compromised mental state. Haw had disclosed to his general practitioner about feeling rundown, having sleep difficulties, and even treating a toenail problem with bleach. Despite Haw's mental complaints, his practitioner had only treated him for physical ailments over the five years of their patient-doctor relationship. In counseling sessions with David McConnell from March to June 2016, Haw expressed ongoing troubles and disclosed a history of feeling down in his 20s, which had resolved when he started working. Haw's goal in therapy was to restore his family life to what it once was, revealing his strong attachment to his role as a father and husband. During their final session on June 21, 2016, Haw appeared stressed but candidly shared his emotional struggles. He admitted feeling the pressure of maintaining a perfect image in the community, revealing his fear of shame and imperfection. This session ended on an emotional note, with Haw breaking down in tears. Throughout their sessions, there were no breaches of confidentiality, and Haw stopped going to therapy after June 21, 2016. On the same day as his last counseling session, Haw saw his practitioner for his toenail issue. He mentioned experiencing sleep problems due to a conflict with a colleague at work, which made him feel isolated. Despite these issues, he did not ask for a sick note. The practitioner noted that Haw was preparing for the end of the school year and looking forward to a holiday in Italy. She prescribed him 10 sleeping pills to address his short-term insomnia and advised him to avoid further work conflict 
suggesting he return if his condition did not improve. The practitioner observed that Ha appeared clear, coherent, focused, and displayed normal behavior with no signs of agitation. She reported no indications of despair or hopelessness, emphasizing that his primary stressor seemed to be the work conflict, and he appeared positive about the upcoming holiday. However, she was unaware that Ha was also seeing a counselor and had an appointment on the same day. In one section of his note, Alan Ha wrote, I cannot let them face a life without me and the shame they would have to bear that their father had committed suicide. I have wanted to kill myself for a long time now and I just could not bear the thought of leaving my mess and the anger and rejection that Clota and the boys would have to live with forever. It is common for suicidal individuals to perceive themselves as burdens to others, believing that their loved ones would be better off without them. Expressions of sympathy were extended to the Call and Haw families by the police, the coroner, legal representatives, and the jury. The jurors deliberated for about 10 minutes before returning the advised verdicts. For Alan Haw, the coroner recommended a verdict of self-inflicted death or suicide. Following her guidance, the jury deliberated and returned verdicts in accordance with the coroner's recommendations. The inquest concluded on December 19th, 2017. Shortly after the murders, women's rights groups in Ireland, such as Women's Aid and the National Women's Council, criticized the Irish press for what they perceived as an overly sympathetic treatment of Alan Haw. Clota's sister and mother were reportedly left 50,000 euros in debt due to the legal costs of pursuing the release of documents. They also criticized the lack of support provided by the state and charitable organizations to their family and the families of murder victims in Ireland generally. They were savagely and brutally killed by Alan Haw in a premeditated and calculated manner. We are aware that the inquest has a limited role in law in that its function is restricted to establishing how where and when our loved ones died. However, it is clear from the evidence presented at the inquest that Cloda and her boys were killed in a sequence that ensured that the eldest and most likely to provide effective resistance were killed first, and that they were executed in a manner which rendered them unable to cry out for help. The case was reviewed in 2019 following efforts by Clota's family, amid reports that Alan Haw had been seen visiting the school where he was employed on the morning of the killings. In 2019, the school where Clota had been employed unveiled a new hall named in her memory. Do you think there is something that was missed that could have prevented this awful tragedy? Share your thoughts in the comments below. If you want more videos like this, please be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on more true crime videos. Until next time, bye for now.